Hi there, welcome to this video. So I'm going to be going through the mark scheme for the nucleic acids exam um, questions, which are in a booklet that looks like this. So down to the first question, nucleotides and structure of DNA. Let's make it a little bit um, bigger. Pitch width, there we go. Um, so DNA is arguably the most important molecule in the whole of biology. When a cell divides, an identical copy of its DNA is made in a process called DNA replication. Explain how pairing of nitrogen spaces allows identical copies of DNA to be made. Three marks. Okay, so basically this question is asking you to describe DNA replication, but uh, making sure we absolutely mention what it says in the question. So the pairing of the nitrogen spaces, nitrogen spaces just means the bases, they just can happen to contain nitrogen, that's why they're called nitrogen, um, and why the copies of DNA are identical. Okay, so just making sure we definitely include the things that they've mentioned in the question. So first of all, what can we mention that explains the pairing of nitrogen as bases? So we could say that A always pairs with T. Oh, let me just change my board on the slant. With T. Um, C always pairs with G. Um, a better habit is to write the bases out in their full names rather than just the letters because sometimes they're picky about that. Um, we can say that they um, pair with hydrogen bond bonds. So we can say that there's two hydrogen bonds between the A and the T and there's three hydrogen bonds between um, the C and the G. Um, why do A and T bind and why do C and G bind? Well, it's always one purine with one pyrimidine and that's because they're different sizes isn't it so the different sizes so we always want um, a single ring with a double ring now if i were you i'd write this out in sentences but it doesn't have to be in continuous paragraph it can be in bullet points OK, so that's basically everything we know about the pairing of nitrogen spaces. Now, it doesn't need you to to recite the whole of DNA replication. It wouldn't it wouldn't lose you any marks, but it does specifically say about, you know, explaining the pairing of nitrogen spaces. Um, so why do we get identical copies of DNA? It's just because these always pair together. Now, you could say if you wanted to, and I wouldn't be surprised if people did, you might have mentioned about how we get um, these exposed bases on here and how the free nucleotides come in and bind on using um, complementary base pairing between them. Um, and then ultimately that leads to um, two new double helices that are exactly the same. So I wouldn't be surprised if you'd gone down the route of explaining the DNA replication um, with that with those diagrams. But this is really where your marks are going to come in. So they suggest one mark for um, the base pairing just there, one mark with the idea of the hydrogen bonds, one mark with the idea of purines and pyrimidines being different sizes. And then the last mark that was available, there's four available, but um, you could only get a maximum of three. The idea that if one base is known, it can only pair with one other base and therefore it always ends up being an identical copy. Um, next one. Figure 5.1 shows part of a DNA strand. Name the base represented by the letter T. So we should know that that's thymine. Nice, easy one. Make sure you know the, what the letters of the bases um, each stand for. On figure 5.1, draw a section of the mRNA strand that's complementary to the section of the DNA um, strand drawn. So you just needed to draw on here uh, the mRNA strand. So T would go with A, C, G, uh, or G, C, C, <laughs> G, G, C, C, G, A. Um, normally it would be T, but it's RNA, so it's going to be U and then T, A. So your mRNA strand would look something like that. All right. Next bit was about um, 
ATP, ADP and ATP. So ATP um, is described as the universal energy currency. Describe how the structure of ATP is similar to and differs from the structure of a DNA nucleotide. Okay, so this is really common because ATP has a very similar structure to a DNA nucleotide. So a DNA nucleotide, we should be familiar with um, looking something like this. So we've got our phosphate, our sugar and our base. Now, um, ATP is very, very similar, but um, we know that the TP part stands for triphosphate. Yeah. So rather than having one phosphate at the top, it's going to have um, three phosphates. So we've got three phosphates. All right. This sugar in DNA, that sugar would be deoxyribose. Now in ATP, let me put an arrow down to here. So this is our DNA, this is our ATP. The sugar in ATP is always ribose, all right? And the base in DNA could be A, T, C, or G. And in ATP, the base, um, <laughs> excuse me, the base is always adenine. Okay, it's always A. So it asks you for similarities and differences. So always split up your answer to make sure you're definitely going to cover both. So it asks for similarities and differences. I would always do little diagrams to help me um, and then go through my answers. So first of first of all, let's look at the phosphates so that's uh, it's a similarity in that they both have phosphate both contain phosphate but it's a difference in that dna has three phosphates um sorry um atp has three phosphates and dna has one phosphate yeah so that's a difference isn't it um, and the next bit is the sugar. So they both have a sugar, but the difference is which sugar they have. So first of all, ATP has ribose as the sugar. And DNA has deoxyribose. Um, they both contain nitrogenous bases. But ATP has the base, ATP has the base A, adenine every time, whereas DNA can have the base A, T, C or G. Okay. And so if you draw them out, the similarities um, should be really obvious, really obvious what the similarities and the differences are. Don't be shy of drawing, okay? You're more than welcome to draw all over exam papers. In fact, examiners like it because um, it makes it really clear uh, what you're kind of imagining when you're talking about it. Question, uh, next question, number four. Figure 16.1 shows the structure of ATP. Name the circled component in figure 16.1. So the circled part up here, hopefully recognize the three phosphates, the sugar, and therefore this part, we might recognize it or we might just um, know that, oh, that must be the other bit, that must be our base. Now we know that the base in ATP is always A, which is adenine. Again, make sure you try to not just write A, but write out the full name, write out adenine, okay? So just to, to reiterate, this bit here is the phosphate or the three phosphates. This bit here is the sugar which in ATP is um, ribose, All right? And that's your base A, which is adenine. Next question, name the type of reaction that occurs when ATP is converted to ADP. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So that's when we've got three phosphates. ADP is adenosine diphosphate when we've got two phosphates. So the reaction is removing one of these phosphates. And 
breakdown reactions usually are hydrolysis reactions, the opposite of condensation. So condensation reactions join things together, hydrolysis reactions break things apart. Part three, a teacher told his students that the human body makes the equivalent of its own mass of ATP every day. That's amazing, isn't it? Explain why at the end of the day, only a small proportion of the student's mass was ATP. We don't become twice as heavy, do we, every day? It's because the ATP is made, but it's also broken down, okay? So ATP is constantly being broken down. And when we talk about um, being broken down or converted to ADP, remember to use the word hydrolyze. So ATP is constantly hydrolyzed to ADP to release energy for the body to use to survive. All the time our cells need energy and it, the energy comes from ATP being hydrolyzed. It's happening all the time. Then the ATP gets recycled. Okay, so the same ATP is getting recycled. So remember the ATP cycle where ATP gets broken down into ADP to release energy and then we add the phosphate back on to store energy. So release energy, store energy, release energy, store energy. That's happening all the time. That's called the ATP cycle. That's happening all the time. It's not always brand new molecules. It's, a, it's the same molecule, the same base. It's just that extra phosphate, that third phosphate is getting added um, and removed. Um, the idea that you understand that this energy that's being released is being used for stuff. So you could say it's being used for metabolic uh, processes or reactions. Um, or you could give examples. So you could say something like active transport. Um, and ATP is never stored long term. OK, so ATP is not stored long term. We make it and we use it within a few seconds. OK, that's why our cells need to res be respiring all the time, because the ATP only lasts a few seconds and it's just broken down and used again. And we need to make more. OK, so it's not used, uh, not stored long term. It's used immediately. Now, the way that question was marked, it was always one marked for saying that it's constantly hydrolyzed, one mark for the um, saying what the energy is then released for, one mark for saying it's recycled, and one mark for saying it's not stored long time or it's, it's used immediately. Next question, number five, figure 21 shows a molecule of ADP. So we can see it's ADP, adenosine diphosphate, because it's only got two phosphates. On figure 21, draw a circle around the part of ADP molecule that is a purine. So remember, bases fit into two categories, purines and pyrimidines. So we're looking for the part of the molecule that's the base, basically. OK, so if we go back up to the picture, we know that these here are the two phosphates. We know that this here is the sugar which in ADP or ATP is always ribose. And therefore, the bit they, they want you to circle for this question is the base. Oops, sorry, I meant to make that red. Is the base up here. It's not, not changing colour. doesn't want to change colour. <laughs> the base up here, this is the circle we want. OK, next one. State two differences between a molecule of ADP and a DNA nucleotide that contains adenine. This is just exactly the same question as we had earlier. Um, let's just recap. So ADP is going to be the sugar is going to be ribose. OK, um, the base in ADP is always going to be A for adenine and is going to have two phosphates this time because it's ADP, adenosine diphosphate. The DNA, on the other hand, is going to have one phosphate, DNA nucleotide. The sugar will be deoxyribose. Okay. And it'll have a base, which could be AD, ATP or ATC or G, but it says here that it's the base A. OK, so it's a little bit more specific. So two differences. Look at the phosphates. So we can see that the ADP has got two phosphates, whereas the DNA 
has got one phosphate. Look at the sugar. So the sugar, the ADP has got ribose. The DNA has got deoxyribose. And look at the base. Both of them have got adenine. So that's not going to be a difference. Next question. ADP binds with an inorganic phosphate to make ATP. Name this type of reaction. So this is joining things together. So it's going to be condensation. Always condensation for joining, hydrolysis for breaking apart. Which structure here shows ATP? So we know that we're looking for three phosphates, but all of them have three phosphates. So that doesn't help us here. Um, so you are going to have to know a little bit more about the structure um, of what you're looking for uh, for ATP than just the three phosphates. So we're looking for um, D here. You don't have to be able to draw it from memory, but you do need to be able to recognize it from a picture. OK, so key things here that make it different to the other ones is on the top two, it had an OH missing from the bottom there. OK, and we need that OH on. Um, and the other thing is the um, base here. So we're just looking for uh, a double ring base. So you don't need to learn the exact structure of the base, but it is a double ring base uh, that should have for adenine. All right. Next part was DNA replication. Number seven, a sample of DNA containing only one isotope of nitrogen, nitrogen 15. Oops. Sorry, I've got another computer with the um, mark scheme, just making sure I cover all the points and it just scanned down too much. So a sample of DNA containing only one isotope of nitrogen, nitrogen 15, was incubated with nucleotides containing only the nitrogen 14 isotope, along with the enzymes needed for replication. OK. So we're starting off with this. OK, so this is our old strands. So the old ones are 15 and it's incubated with nucleotides containing 14. So this is going to be the new ones are going to be 14. You've got to get your head around what it's saying, haven't you? Which of the following diagrams would represent the resulting DNA after one round of replication? OK, so the old, the original one is going to have two strands of 15. OK, in DNA replication, it's going to open up and those original strands are still going to be 15. I don't know if it's going to let me change colour. didn't let me a minute ago, did it? I can change to black because that's really selected. So the new strand here that's going to be added is going to be incorporating 14 nitrogen, bases containing nitrogen 14. So then the, the two new strands that it's going to make are going to have one strand of each. So the new ones are going to look like that, aren't they? With one strand of 15 each and one strand of 14 each. So we're looking on here for one that's got one strand of each. Oops, let me just move down a little bit. OK, so that one is obviously A. You can see it's got one dark strand and one light strand. Right, the next part, sorry, this has gone on the top of it. I don't know if it's like that in your book, Claire. Um, Table 5.1 contains a list of statements about DNA replication. Some of these statements are incorrect. Put a cross in the box next to each incorrect statement. So in DNA replication, does the DNA molecule unwind? Yes, it does. So we start with it as a double heat. Oops. Where's it gone? <laughs> Let's draw up here. We start with a double helix with it wound up. And the first thing it needs to do is it needs to start to unwind. So, yes, it does unwind. Hydrogen bonds between the base pairs break apart. Yes, they do. Look, these bases on this side and the bases on this side have separated because the hydrogen bonds between them have broken. Free RNA nucleotides join onto the bases on the free um, exposed strands. So this is nearly right, but not quite. So we, those exposed bases there do have new nucleotides bind onto them. But in DNA replication, we're making DNA. So they're going to be D 
DNA nucleotides, whereas this question said RNA nucleotides, and that's why that's wrong. The next one, both polypeptide strands act as a template. Now, both strands do act as a template, but the reason why this one is wrong is because they're not polypeptide strands, they're DNA strands. Yeah, so this one again should have been DNA. Both DNA strands act as a template, but both polypeptide strands don't. It's not made of protein. Hydrogen bonds then form between complementary bases. Yes, they do. So hydrogen bonds are formed between those new, nucleot new nucleotides and the exposed bases on there. So that's right. Three hydrogen bonds between A and T. That's not right, is it? We know that we have two hydrogen bonds between A and T. Oh, it keeps moving it down, doesn't it? And three between C and G. Um, DNA polymerase links the new nucleotides. Yes, it does. So those new nucleotides that are like this then get joined together to make a continuous strand. And that's um, DNA polymerase that does that. And it's making phosphodiester bonds. So that one's right. Oh, I don't know why it keeps doing that, sorry. I'm probably leaning on something with my hand. Okay, so uh, that's right. And the last one, covalent bonds form between the phosphate of one nucleotide and the pentose sugar of the next one. That's right, because those, oh, I can't draw because those um, uh, those phosphodiester bonds are, um, are covalent bonds. Okay, next question. Number nine, the genetic code carries information for the synthesis of polypeptides. State the number of DNA nucleotide bases that code for a single amino acid. We know it's a triplet code, so that should be three. There's a maximum of 64 different base combinations in DNA that could code for an amino acid. How is this number of combinations calculated? You can say four to the power of three, or you could say four times four times four. Either of those give you an answer of 64. 20 different amino acids are commonly used for protein synthesis. In theory, this would only need 20 different base combinations. Explain the uses of the remaining 44 combinations. So the, um, the genetic code, if you think about the grid where, or the circle where we look them up, you know that there are several triplets for one amino acid. Um, so there's several triplets for one amino acid. And also some are used as stop codons. So they don't cut in, they don't put an amino acid in. Um, next one. Which nucleotide bases are common to DNA and RNA? So we know that DNA has A, T, C, G. We know that RNA has A, U, C, and G. So the answer is A, C, and G. They're the ones that they both have in common. Back to multiple choice, genetic code and transcription. Um, which of the statements A to D shows that genetic code is degenerate? So CCA and CCT code for proline. So that's showing you that more than one triplet codes for an amino acid. So that's correct. Let's double check that the others aren't and say why. So rRNA is manufactured in the nucleolus. OK, so that's nothing to do with each amino acid having more than one triplet. tRNA is not complementary to DNA. It's nothing to do with more than one codon for a, an amino acid. And uracil is not found in DNA, so they have nothing to do with it. Degenerate means that there's more than one triplet for some amino acids. Okay. A length of DNA has the base sequence, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read that out. Select the row that shows the correct complementary DNA strand and the sequence of mRNA being made during transcription of the DNA sequence above. Okay, so first of all, 
complementary DNA strand. So DNA complementary to this, it's going to be T, T, A, G, C, G, C, C, A, G, C, G, A, G, T. OK, so find the strands that say that. OK, so that one doesn't say it, so it can't be A. All right, so both, all of those are right, aren't they? They're all the same. Then we're looking for the mRNA sequence. So <laughs> we know that RNA doesn't have, t so we know it can't be A already. We also know that RNA has U instead of T, so it definitely can't be that one. All right, so then we're looking for which one of these um, can it be. So we want it to be complementary to the original um, length of DNA. OK, so the, M the mRNA, you might think, well, which strand is the mRNA made on? Because it's made on only one strand. Just go with the original one. That will be the one that they mean. So it wants to be complementary to um, this strand here. OK, but it needs to obviously have um, U's in it instead of T's. So it brings us out to row B. Next section is translation. So the plasma membrane contains proteins which are made within the cell. Outline the process and the organelles involved in translation of these proteins from RNA. Now, because it says organelles, the only organelle we really think of to do with translation is the ribosome. But it says multiple organelles. So just be careful that you, that you do the whole story of translation that spans across more than one organelle. So first of all, we're going to go from the nucleus to the ribosome um, and then on to the Golgi. OK, now the ribosomes are found on the rough ER, which is another um, organelle as well. So what happens in each of those places? So first of all, the mRNA is made in the nucleus and then it's transported out of the nuclear pores. OK, and then it's taken to the ribosome. OK, so we can say that the mRNA binds the ribosome. OK, then we get um, protein synthesis at the ribosome. I'm not going to go into all the detail of protein synthesis because I can just see from the number of marks that I don't need to. But if you had done, it's no harm. But if you've described the process and you've said that happened on the ribosome, then that's absolutely fine. So protein synthesis happens at the ribosome. We'll just give a really brief overview of it. So the tRNAs bring the amino acids. They bring specific amino acids. Um, if you've described anything about how the tRNAs work, that will get you that mark. And then um, peptide bonds form between the amino acids. And then the, the polypeptide that's made goes to the Golgi and describe what happens to it. So the polypeptide uh, modified and packaged in the gold G. OK, you didn't need to write it across the page like that, but what that does is it just really shows you that I'm talking about how proteins are made. I'm talking about translation, but I'm really putting the emphasis on the organelles, which is what the question asked for. So it's just not regurgitating the revision guide every time. It's applying it to what the question wants. OK, so talking about it in context. Number 13, um, we need to match up the words. So the enzyme something joins nucleotides together to make a copy of the gene. OK, so if we're making a copy of the gene, that copy is we're making mRNA. OK, so if we're making RNA, it's going to be RNA polymerase, not DNA polymerase. OK, so it can't be A. We can cross out the whole row of A. So that means to be RNA polymerase. Next one, this makes the molecule something which leaves through the nuclear pore. So we know that it makes the molecule mRNA. So we need to choose mRNA for two, not RNA, rRNA. So let's get rid of this one. 
which leaves through the nuclear pore and binds to the organelle that's made of protein and what? So the ribosome this is talking about. So ribosomes, we need to know, are made of rRNA and protein. OK, so we want the three rRNA. So we don't want tRNA. So that leaves us with um, B. Let's make sure it makes sense. The amino acids, so that should be rRNA. The amino acids are assembled here when something brings specific amino acids. That must be tRNA. Double check that we've got tRNA left. Yes, we have. So our answer is B. Next one. Number 14, sickle cell disease is a genetic disease that results from a substitution mutation in one of the genes that codes for haemoglobin. OK, so a substitution mutation, what it means is it swaps um, one base substitutes it swaps one base so figure 16.2 below shows part of the mRNA sequence that codes for normal hemoglobin and the correspondent sequence of amino acids so here's our triplets in our mRNA here's the amino acids then the next diagram shows you um, the genetic code and the first thing you needed to do here is to identify the amino missing amino acids one and two OK, so it's hard to get it all on the screen, so I'll just write it lower down. So number one was ACU and number two was CCU. So then you need to use your genetic code. Sometimes you get this in a square and sometimes you get it in a circle. So ACU, we use the highlighter, ACU, so three in in, and CCU, CCU is going to be proline. So we should have threonine and proline. And your answer line was underneath. So on there, we should have threonine and proline. Outline the role of RNA polymerase in the production of the mRNA sequence. OK, so this is basically asking you about transcription and what does the RNA polymerase do when it's making mRNA? So the ACE tells us that it's an enzyme and the polymer tells us that it makes a polymer. So it joins monomers together. That's what making a polymer is, isn't it? And the monomers that it's going to join together are RNA. OK, so it's going to join RNA monomers together to make a polymer. OK, so what are those monomers specifically? They are the RNA nucleotide. So what RNA polymerase does is it joins the RNA nucleotides. And remember, it joins them. If we draw some phosphate sugar base, phosphate sugar base it joins them with phosphate diester bonds between the phosphate and the sugar okay so it joins them with phospho diester bonds between the sugar and the phosphate it's not joining it to the bases the bases are joined to each other with hydrogen bonds which is a separate bit okay in sickle cell disease, the haemoglobin contains the amino acid valine in one of the positions normally occupied by glutamic acid. State the base sequence on the anticodon of a tRNA molecule that brings valine to the ribosome. OK, so. If we look at um, valine on here. Go back up and find um, valine. Did it go back right back to the car? Was it in here? So it said that it should have had glutamic acid and it changed to valine. So glutamic acid was GAG. OK, GAG. And now it's going to code for valine. So find valine on here. Valine is here. So valine, it can be GUG. G U 
um, A, G, U, C or G, U, U. Now we know that originally it was G, A, G and now it's coding for valine and it's had a single substitution. So what we're looking for is how did it mutate from G, A, G to one of these with a single substitution. Now the only one that it can be is um, G, U, G isn't it? It has to be that one. Okay. Now this shows us the mRNA codons, doesn't it? Yeah. One of these charts shows us the mRNA codons that code for each um, amino acid. Now the question then has actually asked you for tRNA. So if on our mRNA, this is a really high level question. If on our mRNA, we had G, U, G, what would the sequence on the tRNA B, so G goes with C, U goes with A, G goes with C. So the answer it's after there is C, A, C. For a simple short question, there was actually quite a lot you had to work out. So the correct answer is C, A, C. Part four, in sickle cell disease, the mutated haemoglobin has a reduced ability to carry oxygen. In some gene mutation, some gene mutations do not affect the protein function. Use figure 16.3 and levels of protein structure to explain why some gene mutations do not affect the function of the protein. OK, so the diagrams that it's, that it's linking back to is basically um, the genetic code and we know firstly that sometimes you can get a mutation so that you've got a different code on and it will still code for the same amino acid and that's called degenerate the degenerate nature of the um, genetic code so we can say the genetic code is de degenerate sometimes you can change uh, change a base which will change your code on, but it will still code for the same amino acid. Okay, so the genetic code is degenerate. Sometimes we can get a mutation. Um, we call them a point mutation if they just change one, one base, and it might still code for the same amino acid. Now it asked you to use the diagram. So you must use the diagram. You must do what it says. OK, so for example, if we go back up here, we could use the valine example that we've looked at. So GUC and GUU, for example, GUC and GUU, go back down. So we could say EG, GUU, and G, U, C, both code for valine. Yeah, so if you had a mutation where the U got mutated to a C, it would still code for valine, it wouldn't change it. Now, <laughs> it said to us in the question um, to use the figure, which we have done, and levels of protein structure to explain why some gene mutations do not affect the function of the protein. So this levels of protein structure is the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. So we need to now incorporate that. So um, if we change, uh, if it does change um, an amino acid, which this is saying it won't change amino acid, but if you change a different one, it might change amino acid. It may amino acid. So if it does change an amino acid, it will affect, it will alter the primary structure. Primary, I just wrote like that. Because the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. So it will change that. OK, now we go on to secondary structure. So the way it forms the um, the way it forms the alpha helix and beta pleated sheet. Um, so if it does change an amino acid, it may change the uh, alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. Show the examiner that you know what secondary structure is. 
of the secondary structure. It may change the overall folding. Three D shape folding of the tertiary structure. And this is because the R group may be in, may be different, but it will form different bonds. Show them that you know what bonds it could form. So ionic, hydrogen, disulfide, for example, if it was a mutation that changed a cysteine, either to a cysteine or from a cysteine, it's going to alter the disulfide bonds that it can form. Um, it might be, on the other hand, this is if it does change an amino acid, it might be that it doesn't change amino acid and then link that to the um, levels of protein structure. So if doesn't change an amino acid, Oops. we could then say it won't affect the folding. Okay, look at my answer, look how I've structured it. When I moved on, I underlined it. It makes it really easy for the examiner to see that you've covered different sections in your answer. So you could talk about degenerate, underline it, then to go on to the next bit, make sections, use subheadings, use bullet points, whatever helps you. I wouldn't write it probably with the arrows. I probably would write it in sentences, but I'd probably write sentences like in bullet points. And I definitely use underlining in a long answer like that to, um, to make sure um, to make sure it's really clear. Right, now the last part of this question, we have to always make sure we've done everything. So we've definitely talked about mutations and then the function of the protein. Now, so far, we've only really talked about the shape of the protein. We haven't said how it might affect the function of a protein. Now, proteins need to have specific shapes so that they work properly. So let's link it to function now. So for example, e.g. if it's a receptor, it needs a specific shape to bind whatever molecule it is. If it was an enzyme, it needs the active site. Oops, active Good. site needs to be a specific shape. And if that changes, then the substrate might not be complementary. And therefore it won't work. Okay, so see how I'm just really picking up on every part of the question in my answer. I'm laying it out really clearly and using techniques like um, underlining and bullet points to really <laughs> make it as easy as I can for the examiner, really, to make sure they don't miss any of the points that I've made. Right, let me move on to the higher challenge um, questions. So number 15, DNA replication and transcription are two processes that occur in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. Compare them. This is really, really common. OK, so. Excuse me. DNA replication, first of all. Let's just draw a little picture just to familiarise ourselves with this one. OK, transcription. Was similar but it made mRNA. Let's add a few little notes. This one made two molecules of DNA. Okay. Um, this one, they're double stranded and it uses two templates. Now this one is only using one strand as a template. Okay, and it's only making one molecule of mRNA and then just leaving the DNA um, un untouched. This one is making DNA, therefore it's going to be DNA, um, nu DNA nucleotides and it's going to be DNA polymerase. Whereas this one's making RNA, so it's going to be RNA polymerase joining together RNA nucleotides 
Um, and then we can go into our answers. But I would always have a little kind of scribble of a, a summary of before I get started. Remember the power of your diagrams for your memory and also to show the examiner to back up the answer that you give. Okay, so first of all, um, let's go through the similarities between the two processes. Excuse me. So both of them, the DNA unwinds, and unzips and that happens using helicase enzymes in both cases. Both of them use a DNA template although it's a different number of strands. Both of them add new nucleotides using complementary base pairing and they join them on with hydrogen bonds. Both of them add on free nucleotides too close to that thing. Let me just go down a little bit. <laughs> Free nucleotides. We say they're activated nucleotides if you want more language. And both of them use polymerases, although they're different polymerases. Okay, so you'll write a sentence probably about a number of those. You don't have to mention all of them. The differences, on the other hand, OK, um, let's just put them in columns. So first of all, DNA replication I'm going to put on this side and transcription I'm going to put on this side. So first of all, um, in DNA replication, we replicate the whole molecule, the whole DNA, whereas on tra transcription, we, oops, we just do copying one gene. Um, in DNA replication, we've got both strands as templates, two template strands, and in transcription, we just have one template strand. Um, the nucleotides in DNA replication are going to be DNA nucleotides, and in transcription, they're going to be RNA nucleotides. Um, the enzyme, if we're making DNA, it's going to be DNA polymerase, and if we're making RNA, it's going to be RNA polymerase. Um, they are actually different helicase enzymes, um, but that's, uh, you might not know that. Um, in DNA replication, um, we make two um, new DNA molecules, and in translation, we just make one mRNA molecule. Um, in DNA replication, the DNA that's made stays in the nucleus, and in transcription, the mRNA leaves the nucleus. Okay, so there's loads and loads you could write. You're not expected to write every single point, but um, you're meant to have a good, um, a good, <laughs> a good range um, of almost all of those without errors. Um, if you were down at like four marks, you might have mentioned lots of those things, but you might have mentioned mistakes along the way. Uh, for six marks, we're just looking at most of those points uh, without mistakes. Okay. We had lots of space to write it out. Number 16, outline how the process of DNA replication is completed following the pairing of nitrogenous spaces. So it's just asking you really for a, a small part of transcription. Um, so after the nitrogenous spaces are added, so if we were to put a little diagram of that, so we've got our exposed bases there, then the nucleotides bind on with their complementary base pairing um, to each strand like that. And then what happens? So what happens is the enzyme DNA polymerase is going to join those nucleotides, nucleotides together. OK, so it joins, um, joins them together on the sugar phosphate backbone because it's between the sugars and the phosphates. Phosphate backbone. So if we were to zoom in on it, we'd have our nucleotides like this okay and we're joining them um, on the sugar phosphate backbone because this is our sugar this is our phosphate 
phosphate sugar so it's a sugar phosphate backbone it's just joining this pattern of sugar phosphate sugar phosphate sugar phosphate okay and they are um, phosphodiester bonds and they are made in condensation reactions And then once those backbones are made all the way up, then it will rewind into the helix shape again. And we'll have two new double helices. Why is DNA replication called semi-conservative? That's very simple. Hopefully you've memorized that. It just means that the new DNA molecule contains one old strand and one new strand okay so we often draw them in two colors don't we like this and that just shows that we've got one old strand and one new strand number 17 a student tried to extract some DNA from a crushed banana at home. DNA dissolves in water, but the student realised that they needed to add something to break open the nuclear envelope to release the DNA. Suggest a suitable substance they could use to release the DNA and explain why it should work. So the answer to that is a detergent. You might have put washing up liquid. Detergent is a better word. Try to get used to the word detergent. Um, and the reason is because it works as something called an emulsifier. And what that basically means is that because our, our membrane is made of these little phospholipids in a bilayer, yeah. So one phospholipid looks like this, and we've got lots of them in a bilayer going all the way around the cell. So our, our cell membrane is actually a layer of two made up of two layers of phospholipids like this. Now what the detergent does is it attracts these little phospholipids away from their neat little phospholipid bilayer and therefore it effectively makes holes in the membrane and breaks up the um, plasma membrane. Okay so it attracts the phospholipids and therefore it breaks up or disrupts the nuclear membrane. Number 18, even the smallest DNA molecules are very long. A kilobase is a unit equivalent to 1000 base pairs of DNA molecule. One kilobase of double-stranded DNA has a length of 0.34 micrometers. The DNA in the nucleus of a cell from a fruit fly called a Drosophila is 5.6 centimeters long. Calculate the number of kilobases in the DNA of the fruit fly. Show you working, give your answers to the nearest whole number. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. So first of all, um, just notice that we've got micrometers and centimeters, okay? So we don't often use centimeters in biology. So if we were to turn that into micrometers, we know that there's 10 millimeters in one centimeter, don't we? So to convert that to millimeters, we would say it's 56 millimeters okay um to convert um, micrometers to millimeters we would time this by a thousand so that would become um two, three, 340 no that can't be right can it we want to go the other way don't we divide by a thousand Apologies. <laughs> Thinking it doesn't look right, that's why I paused. So 0 0.000. Um, the mark scheme's gone the other way, that's why I'm that's why I'm pausing. So move the decimal place three spaces. One, two, three. So the decimal space is gonna be there, put your zeros in there. So you zero 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 three four. Okay, because the point was there, one, two, three. Okay, so if we want them both in millimetres, we've got our numbers just there. Okay, um, and then you can do 
equals um, simply one divided by the other. Um, the answer you should get is 164706. OK, um, if you don't get the right answer, you can pick up one on one mark from having um, some kind of correct working um, along the way as well. OK, so you can just see that I just paused the video just to draw a diagram of that. So just if that helps you with it. Um, they were telling us here that one kilobase of double-stranded DNA had a length of this, and we worked out that that was that. I just drawn it, so they're telling you that a length of a thousand base pairs of one kilobase is this long, and it's saying the Drosophila has a longer, has more DNA, it's fifty-six millimeters. So it's just asking you what is the equivalent number of kilobases in this. Okay, so all we needed to do was this divided by this, which I've just shown you here. And that should give you your answer um, just there. Part two, the DNA of the fruit fly was analysed and 22% of the bases was adenine. What percent were guanine? This is really, really common. So we know that A always binds with T. So if we've got 22% A, we're going to have exactly the same percent of T. So that equals already 44%. That leaves us with 100 minus 44 left for C and G, okay? So 100 minus 44 is 56 for um, C and G added together. Half of 56, because you're gonna have half C's and half G's, is 28. So then you do 56 divided by two equals 28, oops, sorry, 28%. So it's 28% um, C, and 28% G, so the answer is 28%. Okay, they're really common. Describe how a nucleotide base sequence in a gene is used to synthesize a polypeptide. So this is kind of um, quite a big question, um, summarizing transcription and translation. Okay, in your answer, you should describe the steps of the process in the correct order. Okay, so it basically wants an outline of transcription and then of translation. All right, so split them up, use your headings, use your bullet points, and just go through the process. It's not a difficult question, it's just a recall question. So, first of all, transcription is when the DNA is used as a template to make mRNA. OK, think about um, the process in terms of an image. You can always draw it. So we use one strand as a template. The free nucleotides come in, they get joined together and we make a strand of mRNA. Yeah. So talk through the process. So um, RNA nucleotides. Making RNA, they're going to be RNA nucleotides. Um, join the template strand. using complementary base pairing. Show them that you know what that means. So A to T, C to G. You could say that they bind with hydrogen bonds. To prove to the examiner you know that there's two between A and T, three between C and G. Um, and then we can say that that's catalyzed by RNA polymerase to join the nucleotides together. Then it makes the mRNA and the mRNA leaves the nucleus through the nucleopores. And it goes to the ribosome, ready for translation. Let's just make a bit more space. So then translation occurs on the ribosome. Imagine what ribosome is, maybe draw yourself a little picture. So we're using our mRNA now as the template and the tRNAs are gonna bring with them specific amino acids. Anticodon on the tRNA is gonna bind the codon on the mRNA. Okay, so split it up into um, steps. So the tRNA brings specific amino acids. 
um, the anticodon on the tRNA binds the codon on mRNA with complementary base pairing. See how I'm always getting these keywords in. Now this time we're going to have a U C G. We're not going to have any T this time, are we? Um, and then the amino acids are going to join with peptide bonds. to form the polypeptide. And you could say that it goes on to the Golgi for modification and packaging. All right, so it's just getting all the details in a good sequence. So the extended answer, so it's not going to be that you say seven things for seven marks, it's just the quality of your answer gives you more marks. Number 20, potatoes often suffer bruising, which reduces their value as a food crop. A variety of crop potato that does not bruise when it's been developed using a technique called gene silencing. Scientists carry out gene silencing by inserting small sequences of RNA in potato cells. These RNA sequences are complementary to mRNA from genes that are responsible for bruising. Use this information to suggest why the technique is called gene silencing. OK, so basically um, the mRNA can't get used. So when the mRNA is, is made, it binds to, let me go up a bit so you can actually see, it binds to these, ex oh, these extra sequences of RNA. Instead, instead of going to the ribosome and binding to tRNAs and making the protein. So instead of being used in translation. So basically, they're still being made. OK, the base sequence in the gene is unchanged. Uh, we're still making the mRNA. But the mRNA is basically being inhibited. Something is binding to it to stop it from doing the job that it's meant to do. And therefore, we say that the gene is not expressed. We haven't really come across the word expressed before. It basically means that we don't make the protein that it codes for. So if a gene is expressed, we make the protein. If a gene is not expressed, it means we don't make the protein. Number 21, semi-conservative replication describes the process by which DNA is replicated in all living organisms. In 1958, Matthew Messelson and Franklin Stahl carried out an experiment that it provided evidence to support the hypothesis of semi-conservative replication of DNA. Messelson and Stahl each um, grew E. coli bacteria in a growth medium that contained only the heavy isotope of nitrogen, nitrogen 15. They transferred the bacteria to a growth medium that had the light isotope, nitrogen-14, and allowed the bacteria to undergo cell division. After each division, the DNA from some of the bacteria was extracted from the culture and centrifuge to separate it. Figure 25 shows the bands of DNA in the centrifuge tubes after a specific number of divisions. The tube labelled Generation 0 in figure 25 shows a single band of DNA containing bases that contain only the heavy isotope of nitrogen-15. Explain how the results from the other generations provide evidence to support the hypothesis that DNA replication is semi-conservative. OK, so we need to just ex explain each one. So basically what's happened here is at the start in generation zero, both of them, can, both of the strands were 15. In generation number one, what happened is that those strands separated and then the new strand that was made was incorporating 15. And therefore, the strands, the new DNA molecules that it made were half 15, half 14. And therefore, it made a band in the middle, put M for middle. In generation two, the starting point was these ones. So they separated out like that. So this was nitrogen 14. This was nitrogen 15. All new strands are nitrogen 14, it told us in the question. So the DNA molecules that it's going to make 
are going to look like this, where this one is half 15, half 14, and this one's both 14s. So when you put it in the centrifuge, this one here made a band in the middle, and this one here is both light, so it made a band at the top. And you can see that here, middle, top. This one was just middle, this one was just the, the bottom. And then after generation three, we had two different starting points. So one of them started like that, and one of them started like that. And then when they separated out, oops, if I just extend these, all the new DNA that forms is always 14, because that's what they were growing it in, it told us in the question. So the new ones that it made were something like this. Okay. And therefore, one quarter of it made a band that was half and half. So this is one quarter of it. Here it was half and half, wasn't it? Because we had one molecule of each. But here we've got one molecule that's like that, and three that are just 14. So three quarters made the top band. Okay, so it's just a case of putting that into words, really. But you can't really understand it without the diagrams that I've just done. <laughs> So, in terms of putting it into words, this is the kind of thing we're looking for. So, first of all, generation one, first of all, um, it shows <coughs> that the new DNA that is made um, contains nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15, and that's why it made a band in the middle. OK, you could talk about generation two and you could say that this shows. If we go to generation two on my diagram that I drew. That one of the new ones had one of each and the other new one was both 14 because all new strands um, will only incorporate um, nitrogen 14. So what you could say is something along the lines of one of the new DNA molecules was all nitrogen 14 and one was half nitrogen, oh, you could say one strand nitrogen 14 and one strand nitrogen 15, so made a band in the middle. Okay. If I were you on those questions, I would draw diagrams to help back you up because it's very hard to explain in words. Number 22, a group of students attempted to extract and purify DNA from a plant in Upper End Meadow. The students used the following steps. They mixed it with detergent, added salt, added a protease enzyme and spooled the DNA precipitate on a glass rod. That just means they turned the glass rod to collect it, wound it round. Suggest so whether this method would successfully extract DNA and purify DNA, justify your conclusion. So whether, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. If it says that, say both sides of the argument. So yes, it would because, and no, it wouldn't because, okay, it doesn't say evaluate or anything, but it kind of implies it. So just be really careful that you do say reasons um, for both. So first of all, things that are good at it is that they did use a detergent, so that would have broken up the membrane. So the detergent <coughs> would um, break the cell membrane. Um, and that could be the cell membrane or the nuclear membrane. OK, um, the salt would be good. So if you mention salt, you can say that it helps the DNA shed water. Get rid of the water. OK, make sure we're always saying why for each of these steps. They used a protease. That was a good thing. So the protease would be good because um, it breaks down any proteins attached to the DNA. No, because think about what they didn't use. So they didn't use um, 
a blender or a pestle and mortar or any kind of physical abrasion, did they, to break down the cell walls? Okay, so there's no blender or pestle and mortar or any step like that to break the cell walls. You could say they didn't use any RNAs to remove any deep, any RNA because they only wanted um, DNA. Um, you could say, more likely you would have said, they didn't use ethanol at the end. And the reason why you would use ethanol is because it just helps to um, precipitate the DNA, bring the DNA out from the solution. Um, makes it kind of float up to the top, doesn't it? Okay, and they never put it in ice, okay? By not reducing the temperature, the enzymes might have broken down the DNA, so to denature the enzymes. So it was a bit of a tricky question because you might have gone with one way or the other and you might not have said both sides of the argument. So just be aware if there's a possibility of two sides to an argument, make both sides of the argument. Figure 24 shows a DNA nucleotide identify two similarities and two differences between the DNA nucleotide shown and a molecule of ATP. Now we've done this lots of times now. <laughs> I'm not going to go through it again. You can see it on the mark screen. Question number 24. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nearly there. <laughs> Explain how the nucleotides in DNA molecule are arranged as two polynucleotide strands. OK, so the nucleotides we know are phosphate sugar base, phosphate sugar base, etc. in a line. And we know that they're joined by phosphodiester bonds. So we can say that the nucleotides are joined by phosphodiester. I'm just going to put, don't write it like that in your exam, but I'm just saving time. Nucleotides are joined by phosphodiester bonds. Okay, then we know that the other strand is anti parallel. So the sugar has the point going downwards instead of upwards. And that would have phosphodiester bond there. And then we've got hydrogen bonds between the bases. Okay, so hydrogen bonds. You'd be better here to say between the phosphate and sugar molecules or the phosphate sugar backbone. Okay, good to mention whereabouts those phosphodiester bonds are. And then we've got hydrogen bonds between the bases. In the middle. Okay, we can say that they're anti parallel. So this strand is pointing this way, this strand is pointing this way. <laughs> Some of you might know that that's called five prime to three prime, and then you call that five prime to three prime. And if you've referenced that, that's great, but it still counts as your anti parallel mark. All right, I think that's the end. Let me just double check. Going down. Yeah, lovely. All finished. If you made it to the end of that video, well done. That was a long one. <laughs>